so hello. Um, my session will be basically about two topics. I will talk a bit about DPDK integration, and then uh, second one will be a bit of uh, how we do multi how we how we do multicorp uh, in VPP. Yeah, so, you well, I introduced yesterday. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so my name is Damian Marion. I'm I'm uh, working for Cisco. I'm working in Dave last two years on VPP. Uh, I am one of the committers, so one of the guys who will argue about your <laughs> commits. <laughs> and uh, on VPP side, um, in the last period of, I mean, last months, I was mainly focusing on multi-core, on DPDK, but also on some, some other stuff. I mean, we are a small team, so we are jumping from one topic to another. Yeah, uh, a bit about DPDK integration. So, uh, as you know, DP, uh, VPP is started a dozen years ago, and at that time there was no DPDK. So, actually, at the moment when they decided to to introduce DPDK support and basically move from the legacy de device drivers to to DPDK drivers, uh, he made some VPP specific changes and this VPP specific code, which is let's say not. It, it's not what you typically see when you see application which is built on, on, the, on the top of DPDK from the day one. Uh, first, uh, first thing in, in VPP is really the initialization. So uh, DPDK, uh, as you know, I mean, you, you who are familiar with DPDK know that the RTEL init is the function which basically brings uh, everything <laughs> up on the DPDK side. Uh, that function, uh, assumes that it is owner of the command line. And for us, that was not really the, the, the case because we already had so our own command line. So what we basically, what we do, we basically generate the, the command line and basically pass this command line to the DPTK ELE in it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the, maybe it, it can be better ways to do that, but it works. So we basically create the, 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 the command line and uh, if you do the show version verbose on the VPP, you will actually see the, exactly what is the, the command line we pass to the DPDK. This is for debugging reasons. If you have some issues, we can, you can see what, what, what is exactly passed to the, to the DPDK. Uh, what we do also is we are trying to be a kind to huge pages. We want to, we, we try to, to really, uh, automate the process of all allocating huge pages. And uh, we realized that it's a, it's sometimes it's not a very good idea to use the, the huge page locations, which is typically slash mount, slash huge, or, or dev huge, or something, because uh, if we crash, if we are, are killed, then we left the junk beh behind us. And uh, the trick which we are actually doing for, for huge, huge pages is that we are mounting their our own mount point. It's uh, defined to be a slash run slash VVP slash huge pages. And automatically after, after we start EIL in it, immediately after that, we are doing something called lazy unmount. Lazy unmount basically means uh, unmount the, the mount point, but do that after all files are not used anymore. So even if you kill the VPP, you will see that we have actually the, 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 the mount point will disappear and there will not be uh, RT something files uh, sitting in the huge, huge pages uh, mount uh, directory. What we do, we try to also to, to make a kind of selection what we prefer from regarding the huge pages. So, so we prefer one gig pages and if we found on all CPU sockets uh, one gig pages available, in that case, we will use them. If there is no one gig pages, we are falling back to two meg pages. If there is, two no, if there, if there is no two meg pages, we will basically uh, display the error message and, uh, and stop. Will you come out or will you try to run this code? Okay, so officially from DPDK, the, the mode of operation without huge pages is considered as debug mode and not uh, production mode, right? So we uh, don't support this as a production setup. There is a way where you can basically pass the command no dash huge TLB, I think it's a command, where you basically f say to DPDK that he don't exist on the huge pages. In, in, in this mode, you can start uh, VPP without huge pages, but it's on your, on your risk because you don't have huge pages and it can easily crash if you, 
if you, especially if you work with the uh, uh, physical hardware. Um, mm -hmm. uh, my understanding and uh, discussions within the DPDK community and usability and so on among uh, Intel people and others are that there isn't really, and I want to know if your experience is different, is that there isn't really any significant degradation in performance between one gig huge pages and two meg huge pages. Well, uh, so there is actually, yeah, th there is actually one important reason. If you try to, to allocate 100 gig of huge pages, if you have this, for example, if you're using vhost user and you're using huge pages also for vhost user, when you start VPP, you will probably wait half of minutes for this memory, DPDK memory allocation, optimization, okay. and process to, to run. Oh, yeah. So yeah. The, it's, 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 it's mainly about just getting VPP f uh, starting faster. Yeah, but this is okay yeah. because yeah. if it doesn't find the one gig pages, it comes down yes. to two Yes, but anyway, the, the, there so is a logic really inside matter. to basically fall back to the two gig. Right, so other deployments yeah. besides what we would be doing, it's, it's fine then, it's fine. Yeah. Never mind, yeah, it's yeah. great. Okay. Um, memory pools and buffers. So what we are doing, we are trying to allocate the memory pool on every CPU socket. And if you take a look into the, yeah. So basically, if you specify DPDK socket mem, and then you can say really for each socket how, how much memory you want to allocate. And this is basically the DPDK socket mem parameter which is passed to the EAL uh, init. And it will basically allocate the mem memory pool. It will allocate the, the memory pool on, on each socket. Uh, the logic which we are using when we are do, uh, running the VPP multi-core is that actually the every, every core, every thread is using buffers which are local to the socket. So uh, on the runtime, even if you, if you move the, the worker thread to the different CPU, we will basically immediately start using the, the, the buffers which are local. So, so really uh, from that, from that uh, side, uh, we are fully NUMA aware. And really we are trying to, to to use the local uh, local buffers, which will not cross the QPI bus. Uh, regarding the interfaces, I will come to that later. Uh, we don't have uh, we don't have basically the automated way to assign local PCI interfaces to the to the CPU socket and to the worker, but this is something you can do on the runtime manually. And uh, you they already covered the really buffer stuff and metadata, right? So I will not go much into that one. Uh, important th thing is that we are basically using the, the private data, private uh, area in the, in the DPDK and buff to, to store the VLIP buffer. And it's a simple formula. So uh, there are two macros, RTM buff from VLIP buffer and the VLIP buffer from RTM and buff, which are basically giving you the, the pointers to, the, to another structure uh, in the buffer. Uh, you can see what is the, the state of the DPDK buffers with the show DPDK buffers. So if you do that command, you will see this is taken on the two socket machine where you have the 32K buffers allocated on, on the each socket. So default is 32K, which is typically enough for any normal usage. If you need more, you can specify in the command line. You can say DPDK number and buffs to something beer, bigger. And then we are coming to interfaces. Uh, uh, we also try to do some automated allocation of the interfaces in VPP. So if you start VPP without any whitelist or blacklist, it will basically try to, to attach all the, the interfaces which are available on the, on the computer and which are not, which don't have assigned IP address. It, we will basically un unbind them from the Linux kernel and we will bind them to the DPDK. So this is how it works to today. If you specify white whitelist by using dpdk and then dev command, you can basically specify the whitelist of PCI IDs which you want to be attached to the to the, the VPP. Uh, uh, commands like uh, how to configure the PDK and uh, in general for all the uh, VPP uh, com uh, command line. Uh, yes, uh, you have it on wiki. It's on wiki, yeah? Yeah, okay, yeah thank it's you. on wiki. Uh, uh, regarding the UAO drivers, we are also flexible. 
So basically, uh, whatever is available, we can use. It can be specified on the command line by saying dpdk, UAO driver, UAO PCI generic. And with, with this command, you will basically say to VPP to use UAO, G, uh, UAO uh, PCI generic as a UAO driver for DP, DPDK devices. Uh, currently, the de default is IGBAO. And in our the, the Debian packaging, actually, when you create the Debian packages, you will also uh, get the P1 package, which is a D DKMS uh, uh, package for Debian. So basically, it will automatically compile the IGBAO driver on the on your for your local kernel. On the VPP side, you can, when you start VPP, uh, you can see that you can basically have the command show hardware and then interface name detail, and you can get some details about the NICs. So this output is taken from the 40 gig fort wheel uh, uh, device. So you can get information about the number of TX and RX queues, uh, what are the features and the offloads and so on and so on, RSS, uh, hashing uh, supported active, and on which CPU socket the specific interface is attached. So coming to the IGB UAO, do you have any preference out of those three? No, no. Whatever you, you, you want. I mean, the situation, my understanding so far is that the, the, differ, the, the only difference between IGB UAO and UAO PCI generic is that IGB UAO supports the interrupts, which we currently don't use, but we plan to, to use them. So. I mean, it's a bit historical. We started working with IGBIO and we just yeah, didn't move to. About things like multiple MSI interrupts, one yes. Other one more easily, you know. Uh, yeah, but we don't care much about okay. that at the moment because we are not doing RX interrupts, so so we are just using interrupts for events, and uh, it it works in both cases. So, yeah. But you have you have. A choice to, to select between them. And then VFI, VFIO PCI is actually the one you need to use when you're using IOMMU. So in case you have IOMMU enabled, you, you should just move to VFIO PCI. Yeah. Uh, okay. You said DPDK is a command line uh, command. Mm -hmm. So at which level? It's under uh, Okay, so, so maybe um, to, to show this a bit, um, So we have two things, and one thing is um, uh, so this is the default uh, configuration which we have uh, when you install Debian package. So this is startup startup config. And actually, you can specify either the starter config inside this file, or you can use the, the same commands, but in single line, passed to the VPP process directly. So uh, when you are doing GDB session uh, with, with Kit, you, you are basically starting VPP Unix Interactive. Here we have Unix, no daemon, log, CLI listen, full core dump. Then we have arbitrary section, and then we have DPDK section. And inside the DPDK session, you can basically specify the common parameters which, which I was showing before. So if you do, so if you want to blacklist or whitelist some device, you can do dev. Or if you don't want to do and remove no PCI. No PCI is basically blacklisting all PCI devices. So. You can add memory for other sockets, and so on. So basically, the, this is the startup config. So it's not uh, what we are using in, in the in the CLI is debug CLI, and this is startup config. It's so completely two different things. Okay. No, okay. no. So uh, we we use uh, DPDK as a library. Uh, what we we can basically select between having the embedded DPDK, which is basically built in the way that we are fetching the DPDK tarball 
from the dptk.org site. And then we are applying the series of patches. Uh, some of them are bug fixes, some of them are just uh, what, what we discussed, I think, two days ago. We are basically ch doing some changes in the MBUF structure to optimize it for our usage and so on. But this is not mandatory. So one option is to really use the, the, the DPDK, which is built as a part of the VVP build process. Another option is to use external uh, DPDK build. And OK. So External, very simple. So this is quite, no, actually I committed this last week. Uh, and, and what do we do about all the patches? Yeah, and in that case you will lose the, the patch. But the idea is that we, we have flexibility between choosing the, to use the, uh, I don't know, I, I was testing with uh, Ubuntu 16.04 uh, DPDK uh, packaging. So basically if you just added the build root uh, platforms, uh, Build, no, build data, platforms, VPP. So you can see here, it's commented out. VPP uses external DPDK. If you say yes and remove the hash, it will basically stop building the, the internal DPDK and it will just search for external one. And then you can specify where is the include here. This is default for Ubuntu 16.04. It's a user include DPDK. You can specify library directory. And last one is you can basically say, do you want to DPDK to be statically or dynamically linked? So basically, if you uh, remove this hash, you will get a uh, VPP image linked uh, to the libdpdk.so. There are also some tools that DPDK provides, like test yeah. PMD. Yes. Do you use any of that in terms of taking the source or? Well, or I mean, I mean they are even disabled in the in our configuration file. Another stuff which I, I can quickly touch is our make file. So what we are doing with DPDK is this is a make file which basically uh, downloads the image. We have the MD5 checksums, just to be sure that the download is correct. And then what we are doing, we are basically modifying the DPDK configuration in the way that we want. So if you go down in this make file, you will basically see this section, which changed the some, some parameters inside the DP, DPDK configuration. So we are disabling timer, uh, LPM, ACL, power, distributor, port, blah, blah, blah. We are go, uh, changing the the number of L cores, because we are running VPP on, on systems with 256, uh, actually it's 144, which is more than 128, which is default. Um, then we are enabling some debugs and so on. So basically, uh, this make file takes the DPDK tarball, it will extract the tarball, it will modify the DPDK configuration file based on this list, and then it will build Actually, then it will it will take all the patches, which are inside the uh, so this is currently what we have. So all the patches which we are applying to the to the DPDK to the zero, it's basically DPDK slash DPDK to the zero patches. So we basically pick all of them, we apply them to the DPDK tree. We modify the configuration file, and then we start building the DPDK. And you will see if there is a lot of Cisco Unix stuff. Um, most of the stuff on this list is actually now upstream to the DPDK 16.04. Few things are not, but we would re really like one day to really avoid completely this stuff and really link to the external DPDK distribution. Yes, yes, I mean, most of them are. I know that, uh, that all the INIC stuff is merged to 16.04. Um, I really cannot comment for every single patch on the list, but I would say 80% at, at least here is already in the 16.04. Okay, yeah, and in particular, um, can I have my little cat chaser? Sure. Uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. In particular, this one, um, you know, this allow, you know, the uh, allow to override the RT, RT delay USEC 
uh, patch. We, we've, we've talked about that one. And the hope is that we can get some agreement with the community to upstream it because, uh, you know, Mumble, you know, when you are running on a single core and you, you know, um, set an interface up, uh, it currently just parks forwarding to the point where our, colle our colleagues in uh, Cisco internal product router land were complaining they were getting BFD flaps because of, you know, turning an interface, an unrelated interface up. Yeah. Hey, Damien? Yeah, this is the trick Dave did. All right. Oh, oh. sorry. So wow. what we are doing, actually, it's, it's a nested trick. <laughs> uh, wow, it's yeah. not that big of a deal. Yeah, we are defining the weak, weak function, and then if we did the if we have the RT delay us all right, then we are just immediately going back from RT delay US. Yeah, and, and yeah. In, in, in the VPP world, the way, that, the way this actually works in excruciating detail is yeah. that um, we, we know for a fact that we're running in one of those cooperating multitasking threads which have a, the ability to just deschedule the multitasking thread and get it out of the way for that long, so that's what we do. Socket memory, so what we use. Uh, oh, this is VHost yeah. user. So uh, yeah. for, for DPDK, so when we are allocating um, packet buffers, we are using a, a DPDK memory pool. We are uh, allocating memory pool on every socket. And then when we are setting up the queues on the NICs, we are basically using the, the buffers from the local socket to the specific NIC. Uh, that is a megabyte. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So th that is the mempool size, and then uh, uh, and then we are allocating buffers from the mempool. Uh, I think 32k is default. So it's not very optimized, but it is just something you can easily check the change. Okay. You said two spaces. Can you repeat that again? You said you said at the global level allocated, and then you said at the socket level. I didn't no, no, it's it's a socket level. So if you do a show DPDK uh, buffer, you will see it how many buffers you have allocated on each socket. And same with, with when you're saying socket mem. It basically, socket mem basically says how, ma how, how much huge pages you're going to allocate on, on each socket. OK, any idea how to go back to the presentation mode? I am? Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. So this is more or less about DPDK. I mean, if somebody has some questions, we can touch it now and then go to the. Okay. Go on. Um, can we get this one? It's just a quick question on the, the multi-socket setup. Mm -hmm. You said that um, when when you boot, it allocates buffers on each individual socket. Is it every socket in the system, or is it dependent on what NICs are actually connected? On every socket, where you uh, which is specified in the startup as a socket socket mem configuration. Oh, okay, so it's in the configuration. Form. Yes. So you can say here. Uh, you can set a socket mem 12400124, and then you will allocate only on first and, and fourth socket. So whatever you configure here, that will be used uh, allocate as a huge from the huge pages. Okay. Any other questions? Is there a method how to uh, automate uh, different uh, configurations? Say, if I have a, a single socket system, a dual socket system, and uh, a quad socket system, how can I uh, uh, make it easier uh, to uh, to run a VPP on every system with uh, the same config? Or I, I will need to have a separate config for each of the configuration. Yeah, I mean, you, you nev I mean, systems are not safe. It's not only about the memory and sockets. It's also about where your NICs are. NICs are connected, so you need, I mean, yes, you can come up with some, let's say, more or less uh, universal configuration, but really the idea is that you adapt your configuration for your system. So if you have dual socket system and your NICs, uh, NICs are attached to the, to the socket zero, then you will allocate socket zero. So it's, it's something you, you cannot really universally do. I mean, we can do some, some 
optimizations in the init and mm -hmm. try to automate some process, but still, uh, in most cases, you will need to uh, to yeah, do it manually. What I think about is, uh, like, uh, if you use tools like uh, LS Topper, which uh, shows you where are your nicks and w what's the affinity of the different mm -hmm. see, uh, m sockets, memory, and uh, uh, express slots, then you can basically uh, convert this into the, uh, some configuration. Say, if we, I, I specified that I want to use follow this nicks, then uh, it, it can be translated into some uh, configuration where a memory have to be located where process have mm -hmm. to run and so on well yeah, sure I mean uh, some stuff we are doing today uh, we are using CSFS to discover the NUMA nodes and the huge pages so so basically when I said that we are doing the automatically using the one gig pages if they are available we are basically using CSFS to really check for every single node how many free uh, one gig pages are available, and if you found that they're all available on sockets, then we will decide to go one gig. So we can implement such kind of log logic in the in the in the initialization uh, function. But yeah, I mean, wh how it works today is really about really about having the startup configuration, which can be changed and uh, optimized for a specific case. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it, it's it's one area which can be improved for sure. Okay, um, let's talk a bit uh, about the multi-threaded multi setups we have in VPP. Uh, we have actually four different modes of operation. What you did so far is sing first one, it's a single core where you basically have all the functions in, in VPP running on the, uh, as a single uh, process. Then we have a multi-thread with worker threads only. This is, uh, uh, let's say, currently mostly used uh, multi-threaded setup. And then we have two special cases. One is uh, multi-thread with I.O. and worker threads. And finally, we have multi-thread with main thread doing I.O. and worker thread. So I think I was mentioning two days ago that we have something called uh, uh, hand of dispatch, which allows us to send the packets between the different uh, threads or different, di different CPUs in VPP. So actually, three and four are utilizing that method. We are using one, t one, one specific uh, thread to just take packets from the NIC. And then we are using hand of dispatch to basically feed the worker threads with the packets. And it can be done in the way that we have a dedicated IO thread, or it can be done in the way that it's, we are calling it IO, but basically it's an input thread. And, uh, and then we have a scenario where we, where we have main thread, which is doing also that functionality. So that is the case number four. Uh, case number two is actually the one which we use mainly because uh, we can utilize the hardware hashing functions to really spread the traffic between multiple threads. So in that cases, we really don't need this spe special IO thread to, to do that work. I didn't get that. Uh, so in the case number three, what is the main thread doing? Main thread is basically handling the, the overall non-forwarding tasks, API, CLI, whatever is needed. Yeah, I mean, it's not really control plane, but yeah, the not doing yeah, it not. yeah, it's not forwarding packets. Okay. But there are some cases when the, and we will see later when we come to the, how the packets are queued to the NICs, that actually in some cases you can have a situation that uh, VPP wants to send packet. So if you do IP probe command, IP probe command is basically sending the IP packet out. And IP probe command will be executed on the main thread, which means that even if you, if, if you, if you don't run traffic on, on the main thread, the packet will go out on the TXQ0 because it's, uh, TXQ0 is always assigned to the main thread. Some of the worker thread will be performing I.O. work? No, uh, th th then all worker threads are also doing I.O. Actually, input work. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so difference no. between two and three is that in two, IO thread grabs the packet from the input, from the DPDK input no, uh, function. Mm -hmm. It does all the, the work and, it, and, and it sends the packet out on the transmit side. Okay. So packets in, 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 in second mode, packet is never leaving the, 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 the specific thread. It's all, everything what is done on the packet, all the graph dispatch pro processing I is done on, this, on the, on the single thread. Then. Yes. Okay, got it. Uh, how to set up this? So the single core setup is default. 
and you don't need to specify anything in the configuration file. If you want to go multi-thread, you need to say what exactly you want to do, and we basically have two ways to configure the thread placement in, in, in VPP. So you are doing this by editing the startup com com file. So inside the CPU section, you can use following commands to basically tell VPP what you want to do in, in such setup. Uh, first command is related to the automatic placement, where you basically say, skip one core and then do three workers. That means that you will actually have the, on the L core zero, you will skip L core zero because typically we don't want to run on the L core zero. So we are skipping first one, then on L core one we will run main thread, and then we will run three worker threads on two, three, and four. That is what this, com this configuration says. So it's, it's a kind of auto placement. You just say, give me three workers, I don't care where, where they are. And then VPP will basically pick the first three available uh, L cores to, to assign the worker threads on them. If you want to be very specific and exactly say what you want to do, then you can do manual setup, like the one on the example above, where you can say main core should be running on the, on the, on the L, cores, L, L core one. So you are, you are saying exactly where you want to be, uh, uh, where you want to have main thread. Then where do you want to have core, core tr uh, IO threads and where do you want to have the worker threads? So in the, in the, in the setup ab above, you see that main core is one, IO threads are on, on three and 19, and workers on four, five, 20, 20 to, to 21. And three and 19 are, are likely the same hyperthread pair in, in, in some systems with uh, 16 uh, cores on the socket. What is skip core? It, it, when you are doing auto placement, you basically say skip first X cores. So start allocating cores after skipping X of them. Skip one will basically skip core zero. If you say skip two, everything will start on core or on, on core two. Yeah, it's not un utterly uncommon to want to skip about half, you know, in a two socket arrangement, it's not uh, unusual to skip half the cores um, if the IO devices are placed, you know, placed adjacent to socket mm -hmm. one, for example. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can use core list and you can use core mask. So we have two options. Core mask is really hex a bitmap, and core list is in the form A, B to C, B, N, C to C, N. So it's basically, uh, I think it, the core list is a bit more convenient to, to type than really calculating the hex mask, but, but bo bo both options are valid. So uh, uh, I have a question. Okay. So how do I attach, if I want to attach a port to the core? Uh, we will come to that. Oh. It's on the, on, the second on the next slide. So this is really a uh, start of configuration when you say how the multi-thread VVP setup should look like. You say this and you will get VVP running in this setup. So sorry, I'm going back a slide mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the second scenario here. How do you maintain uh, uh, ordering of frames when each thread is doing I.O.? So uh, we are using hardware hashing, RSS. Or an, in another setup, we just assign one port per thread. And then, if you're doing hardware hashing, you basically, your NIC will ensure that uh, packets belonging to the same flow will heal, hit the same thread. Got it, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you want to see on the runtime, what is the setup? VPP setup in multi-core, you can do show threads. And you will get the table with the uh, name of the worker threads and main threads. You will see the type, Linux PID. And then you, here you can basically see the, what is the L core. It's a DPDK L core. The, the physical core and physical socket of the specific thread. Can we add or remove the threads at one time? No, no, currently no. Thank you. Okay. Uh, how the thre threads are, I mean, I just uh, take out from the, from the code the part which is registering the, the thread. 
uh, as a, let's say, a, to basically show how it looks like. So if you take a look into the devices slash dpdk, dpdk init dot, no, thread dot c, you will see this part of the code. It's basically a macro, vlib register thread, which basically registers the new thread on the, and that is the reason why we cannot do it on, on, start, on, on, on runtime today, because it's basically a, uh, defined here on the on the so so basically you define the the name it's a worker thread short name we use short name in some outputs and then you define what is the the starter function and finally the heap size the private heap heap size I'm not even I'm not even sure that you know worker threads want to do that anymore because the main the, the yeah. main heap is thread safe these days yeah yeah I wouldn't, be I wouldn't be surprised if we're actually wasting a bundle of memory that way. Okay. <laughs> Never know. Yeah. And then basically what we do, so basically when you start EIL init, EIL init will kick, out, kick, will kick the other threads and, uh, or not. I'm not sure actually. Is it EIL init or there is another function to start other threads? Anyway, yeah. sure. sorry. So basic question. Uh, threads here are not uh, are, are uh, could be anything, right? Could be a VM, could be a, a bare metal yes. thread. Yes. Okay. So uh, important thing is that we we have the 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 VPP thread can be DPDK thread, but it can also be a standard Unix P thread. Okay. So in that case, yeah. if one thread dies, why can't we take it out of the system and maybe fail over to something? Uh, to I mean, we one? can. I mean, but you said you can't kill them. No, you, you, there is no way, way to, to do it in the programmatic okay. way today. Okay. But it's something which can be added, all right? Okay. Yeah, actually, we are sharing the code, and that is the way how to basically reuse the same function two times. Right, right. Yeah, it's a trick, <laughs> yeah. Uh, w is uh, just the name of the. Yeah. So there's no other uh, option like the one at the bottom. W. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I see the I/O. Uh, honestly, Dave, do you know why this I/O is in inside the worker thread? Let's see. Uh, String mm. I/O. Let's see. Well, what, is, what does it actually do? Do we want to just look through the code? Yeah, we can that? take a look into the code. I mean, yeah, in, yeah. In, in, in all cases, use the force and read the source, young Skywalker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll let you find it. I'm just going to. Uh, there's. We are just a heads up. We, we, we take this back up after the break. We are going to Okay. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> okay, so next important thing for multi-threading setup is really how, the, how do we synchronize between the threads. <coughs> and this is actually very, very simple. Uh, what we do, we're basically assuming that all code which is not really de de defined as a thread safe is, is not thread safe. Right, Dave? We are assuming that basically all, all stuff which is not really declared that is thread safe is not. Yeah, so right. Yeah. Right. It's a, it, this, this is an opt-in thing that most of the debug CLI commands are, well, all but a very few are assumed to be mm -hmm. thread unsafe. So what you'll get is a, bar a work, your worker thread barrier sync out of yes. it. Yes. Yes. So basically, in the, when you define command, if you say is MP safe equals one, that is basically uh, signed to the, to the VPP that this command is thread safe and it can be run without stopping the worker threads. In all other cases, we are stopping the worker threads. Yeah. And, and we do the, the, yeah. the API message handlers are the same, that they're marked with, I hope, the same name, although knowing yeah. me, I might have said is thread safe yeah. there just yeah. to annoy people. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, whole, the whole point is things are declared to be thread unsafe unless proven otherwise. And yeah. you need to be relatively careful yeah. with it. Yeah. So, uh, if you try to do, I don't know, program the million routes uh, by doing CLI one by one, probably you will not get it very fast because every time it will basically stop threads, execute your single line, restart the, 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 the old threads. And in the code, if you look for those three macros, actually, I don't know if they are macros or functions, but 
basically what we do is we leave worker thread barrier sync, barrier release, and barrier check. And it's very simple. We have the, the dispatch loop running on every worker thread. We we want everybody to stop, we basically just issue barrier sync. We wait for all threads to stop. Then we do part of the code, which is so that is basically what uh, barrier, barrier sync will basically wait all threads to stop. Then it will execute the part of the code which needs to be uh, which needs to be protected, and then we are doing barrier uh, release to basically allow uh, worker threads to run again. I noticed one of one of the things you know one of the things about the way the worker threads are is that the um, the the barrier check is at a point where the uh, internal or interior graph nodes are cleaned out so that you don't have half process packets in flight because it's it's fairly bad to go start thrashing the uh, yep. for example thrashing the adjacencies with uh, threads in flight you can you can imagine oh I'm deleting you know I'm deleting a route or, or doing something out the route delete case isn't bad but if you're deleting something and you have a packet whose metadata has been marked up with a session you're killing oops yep. unless you're careful about yep. it you know, you just don't want to have 100 packets that are marked up with something you just deleted. Uh, it's far better to say, okay, stop the parade, fine, do what you need to do to the data structures, and then start the parade again. Ah, threads, let's see. So if you take a look into the dpdk threads dot, uh, <coughs> dot c, you actually see the, the main worker thread loop. It's a dpdk worker thread internal. And first thing in the loop is we leave worker thread barrier check. So on every iteration of the, of the, of the loop, we are basically checking if there is a, somebody who wants to sync. If somebody wants to sync, we stop. And, and when the, the, the guy who is, sync, uh, <coughs> is done, then we are basically continue executing this loop. And it's a basically very simple loop, which calls the dispatch node. And that is the main function, which is also called in the single core setup. So it's very, basically we are doing the same stuff with, uh, inside the worker thread, like we are doing on the, on the single yeah. core setup. Yeah, comma, except for no yeah. processes and no timer wheel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So your CPU time now is in milliseconds? Huh. Or microseconds? Clock ticks. Clock ticks. Yeah, CPU time now is actually reading the TSC on the on the Intel CPUs. So one question on the TSC. I was hearing the TSC itself is like a flaky camera. When you call it, you get some performance off. So is that true? Or how I don't think so. I think it's quite. It's 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 not it's not <laughs> awful. Moreover, we're, yeah. we're calling it you know once per you know basically once per frame, so you might get one one of those and then go spend some number of microseconds processing. We we, we want to get you know per graph node we want to get pretty accurate uh, you know uh, clocks per packet stats, so that amongst other things you can point and say yeah that node is really slow why. So yeah, it doesn't it, it sure it surely doesn't call it once per packet. It's one that's a per frame thing. Yep. Generally you can be a little bit a little bit more lackadaisical about per frame things because at high rates even you know uh, even on a fast CPU you're looking at a number of microseconds go by and it's not that big of a deal. Moreover, it's really worth knowing the answers. Yeah. Be bigger. Yeah, what what is what is the error? How, you know how many how many clocks off is it really? I mean, this is this is really interesting. It's few clocks. Yeah. Okay. Well. I think it's about ten ten clocks. It's oh, t ten clocks is really not significant when you're talking about uh, you know a hundred packet vector and maybe you know fifty clocks a packet. So that's that you're doing a, a snap where you're hoping for you know five thousand plus or minus ten. So it's. You know, it's probably a less than one percent error. So, so you actually read it once per vector, not once per packet. Yeah, 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 per, per vector, packet. not okay. per packet. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. per vector. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So that that, that yeah. is basically okay. the the math is very simple. In your in your processing oh loop, yeah. in your processing loop, you are basically returning the number of uh, of packets, and this the, the number yes. of clocks yes. is divided by the number of packets processed in the loop. Yeah, makes yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah. 
when, when you when you say there's you know maybe plus or minus ten clocks, is it you know is 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 there a, a bi is there a bias to the error? Is it basically you know ten plus or mi you know ten plus or minus uh, you know with a mean error of zero? Do you, you know I? This I don't know exactly, but I can speculate. We saw about uh, uh, the out of order execution, uh, so we saw that 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 is rationalized yet the orders in the pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah, you know, have to have to find somebody at university to try to try and you know speculate on whether it, you know whether there's a, a bias in the error, you know, because you could kind of correct. Well, be interesting to see if you could write a program to write a program to compute it, but it's probably so dependent on the yeah. instruction stream and how many yeah, things but, are. But fused. the point here is oh, that well. actually the, we are reading the uh, the the TSC on in the same loop, so the the pipeline reordering will be always the same. So I I think we are quite good, right? Yeah. I mean, it's always the, the same code which is reading the the TSC. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Uh, okay. So how we are uh, we are mapping the if interfaces to DPDK and threads. Uh, in the standard setup, the without uh, enabling the RSS, uh, we basically have one one t uh, RxQ per interface. And if you enable RSS, currently RSS can be enabled only uh, for the same number of queues on all interfaces, but the plan is to really enable the, the CLI and API to really specify for every single interface number of queues. But right now you can do it only for on the, in the start of config for all interfaces in the system. So if you enable, enable RSS, then you will have, I don't know, two or four uh, queues uh, for, for each interface. So what we are basically doing, we are maintaining the the very simple structure, which is called DPDK device and queue, where uh, first number is actually DPDK port ID, and second one is queue ID. And then, then we, we are basically uh, on, the every, uh, on every thread in the main uh, DPDK input uh, loop, we first, what we do, we basically uh, take the CPU number, and this value will be different on, on depending on, on which thread we are running. So CPU index is actually for a first worker thread it will be one, for second worker thread it will be two, and so on. And then we are basically going through vector of this structure per CPU. So basically what we have in the DPDK ma main structure, we, have, we are maintaining the vector of, of interface slash queues per CPU thread. <coughs> so if the CPU index is one, this will be also one, and we will be going through a vector, vector of devices by CPU for thread one. With this approach, we basically, we will basically pull only the interfaces which are assigned to the specific thread. And by simply modifying this, this vector, actually array of vectors, we will be able to basically shift the, the, this CPU and Q to the, to the different worker thread. So it's, it's very simple. I mean, it's just a very simple structure containing those two informations. And if you want to basically modify the code it works, you have the command show DPDK interface placement, which basically will just show you which interface and queue are, are assigned to which worker thread. So in this setup, we have queue zero of uh, first and second interface assigned to the, to the thread one, and on the thread two is queue one and queue two. If you want to change the placement, you can do set DPDK interface placement, then interface name, which queue, and, and where do you want to put it, on which thread. And after executing this command, if you, if you do show command again, you will basically see that we, we moved this guy, uh, actually 201Q1, we moved it to the first worker thread from the second one. Uh, there is a small issue which uh, Sergio uh, uh, 
pointed out is actually that uh, what I said before is actually not working correctly right now in the code, so we need to fix that. Uh, it, uh, DPDK deep, deep interfaces are assigned the memory pool on the, on, the, on the initialization, so even if you do this, the interface will still continue using the, the memory pools from the old socket. So we will need basically to, to fix that by reconfiguring the interface on, on, on this event. Yes, the, the, the pool. yeah pool which is used by by uh, to refill the the queue on the Eric's burst. Okay. Sorry, sorry, I, I didn't get that. Can you maybe take a mic? Um. Okay. Um, the RxQ is, is assigned uh, a memory pool, so yes. it would make sense that that memory pool is created with memory belonging to the same socket, mm -hmm. but it's not enforced. This mechanism is not enforced. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. So we, we need to fix that definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You will. You will see for yourself that you have a problem later, mm -hmm. if yep. you're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What we do on the tr transmit side? So uh, on the transmit side, we basically uh, optimal scenario is that we have at least one transmit queue per worker thread. Then every worker thread ca can use his own um, TX queue, and there will just not er there will be no need for locking of specific queues. But this is always not correct. So we have basically mechanism to address the cases where we don't have enough transmit queues to to basically give one queue to the worker thread. We, we, we have one uh, large scale setup with uh, uh, 70, 72 uh, workers on this four socket machine. And actually we realized that we cannot do this on the fourth field because on the fourth field the, the limitation is 64 TX queues. After that one we are just getting DPDK error that we cannot <laughs> assign more queues. So what we basically are doing in that case, we have lock. We have lock uh, on the transmit on the transmit side, and actually, we have the, the we can de define the number of the transmit queues, which are used on the on the transmit. It can be one. In some cases, the DPDK will just say this this specific interface type supports only one queue. It can be five. It can be I don't know, sixteen, and so on. Or you can manually pre-configure that value. And actually, fourth wheel driver is uh, not doing this properly because it will report that the, I think 96 queues, but uh, when you try to, to allocate 64th one, it will just drop the error. So we have the, the command line argument to basically for enforce the maximum number of TX queues, on, uh, which is also one of the startup uh, configuration parameters. And if you do this, we basically run into the lock on the, on the transmit side. Uh, we have this pointer, which is uh, basically pointer to the to the to the single cache line to avoid false sharing we really uh, allocating the full cache line just for a lock and we do this only if we want locking if we don't we are if we are not locking we, we, are, we are we this this pointer will be it will be it will be null if we want locking we will basically it will basically point to the single cache line which is used as a as a lock for the specific interface we are checking the the at, we are doing atomic uh, lock test and set on this uh, memory area, and if the the lock is uh, there, then we will basically try to use the second second queue in the in the pool of queues which we have configured. So if we have the eight TX queues, we will try it with with uh, one, and then on every iteration of this while loop, we will basically check the next one. So basically, it can happen that two worker threads are trying to write to the same to the same uh, uh, transmit queue. First one will will put a lock on the transmit queue. Second one will see that the lock is there, and it will try the next queue in the in the pool of queues which we are using. Up to the moment that when he he finds the one which is uh, available. So this is what this simple loop does. So the DPDK has the structure like for uh, all the CPU to each each CPU have its own transmit queue. So that standard structure, what DPDK does, does not have the capability. You have to write your own. I'm trying to understand 
what gap the DPDK has. It's not, a, uh, it's not about DPDK, it's about the number of transmit queues available on the physical NIC. On the physical NIC, okay. Yes, it's about physical NICs. You are not talking about the one transmit per uh, per CPU, but you are talking we about... Are do, we, we, to, to have the, the, the direct access to the transmit interface, we are allocating uh, every thread have his own queue to avoid collision. Correct. But in cases when we don't have the, 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 the enough queues to really as associate a single queue per thread, in that case, we need to do this. Okay. So if you have enough transmit queues, this lock, this will be zero. So this, is, this will not happen. Okay, so you're trying to ad address yeah. the number of, number yeah. of queues on the NIC here. Yes. So you have yeah, so yeah. many yes. CPUs yes. in your system. Yeah. Yes. You, okay, the yeah. number of queues in the NIC is the bottleneck and you're trying to... Okay. Exactly. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. Any questions? Yeah, just to, just to say it explicitly, for some NICs, the you know the the number of hardware que the number of TX queues can be as low as one, yep. and if you've got n worker threads duking it out or one, you know you want it to you want it to work and be correct, but yep. uh, performance is a little optional. If you if you end up having to do this in a big way, performance is going to end up being a little bit optional. Although if you have 32 threads and 16 queues, it's not going to be so awful because in all probability. I mean, one thing you could imagine doing would be to do some rotor so you don't always start at the same place in the pool. But, mm -hmm. you know, you, you mumble. This, this is plenty enough because normally, it, you know, you give each thread one queue. Yeah, but we are not starting on the same one. It's, uh, it's module. Oh, I didn't, well, I didn't, I didn't see how so you So worker number one will start with Q1. Oh, yeah, okay. Wo yeah, worker number it. five will start with five, but if five is not available, it will try six. Got it. Yeah, that's probably yeah. as good as. Uh, I have yeah. a question. Sorry. Yeah. Question. yeah. Um, okay. This is uh, uh, that is not taking the priority into account, right? The no. Number of priorities will be on top of this. That yes. is like if I if I have four priority queues, then each thread should have yeah. in the, you know uh, dedicated four priority queues, correct? Otherwise, you'll be clashing with. Uh, no, other th this, th this doesn't have anything with, with the priority queues. This is just a simple hardware queue, trans transmit queue on the on the physical NIC. Yeah, so yeah. the hardware queue yeah. normally yeah. it yeah. comes with the priority yeah. as well, yeah. right? Yeah. Typically, like eight priority queues uh, or four no. priority queues. No. Yeah, they this do. is just a simple okay. transmit queue, no priorities. I thought uh, even uh, uh, Intel uh, Niantic, you can configure it to be like. Uh, we are not touching that. Uh, Thunder X has an uh, inbuilt priority. It's not a software um, scheduler, so hardware scheduler, so it has a uh, built-in yeah. priority into the thing. Is, uh, one VM has 8Q, but uh, you can have 256. Right. So uh, when, you, when, you, when you queue the packet, you queue the packet into the priority queue, right? Otherwise, your high-priority uh, packet would be behind a low-priority packet until the hardware takes a look at it, look at it right? We might want to take a deeper look at that. I think we might require more number of queues per Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a different part. What we Nick is, do, is doing to, how, how Nick is basically assigning the queues to the, to, to basically, to enqueue queues to the, to the physical port is different story. This is really about just having the transmit queue per, per worker thread. And they are parallel. For, for, for VPP, all those queues are equal and they're parallel. So if the NIC is actually doing any hierarchical scheduling or any scheduling at all, this is orthogonal what this code is doing, right? It will just work. If the, if the NIC is scheduling based on any uh, marking in the packet, it will just keep scheduling that, right? If you have 10 packets or eight, let's say eight packets, each one of them different priorities, how do I tell the hardware to send one um, ahead of the other? Based on packet marking. But the uh, hardware has a, to this is, this is scan all the packets before it can even determine what packet should go out. That doesn't happen normally. You have normally eight queues. You just queue it to the hardware. Like, you know, you send so it I think Quas' discussion is, I think that Dave said it, is, is quite involved. So maybe we can have a yep. breakout later today or tomorrow. It's a very interesting discussion because that's something that we definitely would like to solve. Thanks. Yep. Yep, so right now we don't have QS, so we are not uh, just, we are treating all the queues as the same. And my last slide, which is a kind of, uh, oh yeah, yeah, the typical uh, issue you can do when you are doing the VPP coding, and you will actually not notice that, that it's an issue uh, up to the point when you try to run the, 
the code in the multi in the multi-core setup. Uh, basically, problem is that if you have a situation that two threads are using the same data structure, and two threads are updating the values in the same data structure, you will probably get very very poor performance because the, you will get the cache line bouncing between the CPU. So I think the Christian will have a bit more about this. I just wanted to cover this very specific uh, case for uh, VPP nodes because we had this exactly the same situation with counters. And if you want to do simple counters, which are basically updating the same value or, or something more complex, still you need to take care for this. So the typical trick what we are doing is that instead of keeping the counter, single counter, we are basically allocating the vector of structures, counter structures. And then every thread is updating his own instance. And then when you want to really to do something with the counter, you just go to the vector, you sum them, and then you use the number as a sum of the, of the fields. So we have macro which is called CLIP cache line align mark. That one will basically ensure that your structure is uh, cache line sized, so 64 bytes, even if you have the less fields in the structure, it will still be at 64 bytes. And then you use uh, VEC validate aligned to basically align, uh, to, to create vector of, uh, of these structures and that vector will be uh, cache line aligned. Uh, number of threads is basically, it's a bit not clear from the first reading that actually what we call number of will mains is minus one is actually the number of threads minus one. So we leave thread in main, you need to get thread main structure and then from thread main structure you can get information of how many threads you have running on the system. And finally, you say for alignment, for the uh, for the VEC validate to align, you need to say that it should be aligned with the with, with the cache line size. So with this, you will basically have them the one cache line assigned for every thread to keep your counters. And then it will it will not happen that if two threads are on the same time updating the structure that they are basically causing the either full sharing or, or cache and ca cache line bounce, bouncing on the <coughs> on that structure. So we had this issue uh, with counters and uh, by simply fixing this problem, I think we get like 20% boost on performance uh, in, the, in the setup with many uh, worker threads. Hey, yeah. hey Damian, yeah. what, did, what, did the fall, what does the false sharing um, scenario look like in like perf top? Can you des describe what people can watch out for since, oh yeah, and, and, and map it to that disease? Yeah, it will be basically just a m m much more clock cycle spent on the, uh. on, the specific, uh, on the specific one. I think that you can see it also by, by using, uh, looking for nukes, right? Uh, I have a question. I, 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 what I observed is that with, with, with false sharing uh, that I also see a lot of uh, uh, nukes on the, on the, on the specific uh, instruction. But I, I don't remember exactly if, if that was the, exactly that's the case. Yeah. yeah. Because in, uh, uh, on Intel CPU's nuke is when you are resetting the pipeline because somebody else is, uh, is writing to the same memory area which was, which was uh, changed by somebody else. At least that was my understanding. I mean, no, but eh. hardware cannot really eh. find out whether it is false sharing or real sharing, right? Yeah, it, it works with cache lines. But we, we need to ensure that the, that the GCC will not put something else in the same, in the same. Uh, what I'm saying is the hardware cannot really do anything about false sharing, right? Because it cannot differentiate whether it is really false sharing or yes, really it's a Yes, that's why sharing. we need to prepare the data structure in the way that okay. we are not True. doing the false sharing. So if, you, if you don't uh, make your structure uh, cache line sized, if you just remove that, that line and just put one counter inside, it will happen that it will be your structure size will be uh, eight bytes, okay. and then the next uh, vector uh, in in that one will be next eight bytes. So basically, you will have two counters in the same ca uh, in the same cache line, but but used by two different threads. So I have one more question about the uh, buffer sizes. A, a good citizen in the network pro network environment, uh, I read somewhere saying that you need you need to have a more priority for receive than transmit. Thereby, the quality of the network will be good. So let's say a NIC chip is designed with that thinking and they give more priority to receive and not transmit. Now, because of that, possibly the transmit jobs are getting delayed. Do you do any uh, tuning in terms of buffer sizes? Uh, normally in DPDK, we have some thumb rules to say the ratio between the transmit buffers and 
the sea buffers? Uh, right Do you have any, any thumb rule? Hmm? We are just putting maximum right now. Maximum meaning yes. like equal uh, receive yeah, equal. For, I think we have uh, by default we are putting 4K uh, buffers on the. How much uh, for how much for receive? How much for transmit? Do you have a ratio or? Uh, on transmit, you don't have the allocated. I mean, ring you have ring on the receive side, right? Okay. On the on the on the on the receive side, you have the ring, which is receive ring, which is filled by the NIC. On the transmit side, you are basically just sending the vector, which is 256 maximum, to the DPTK TX burst. Okay, yeah. so so the DPDK um, by by default has some uh, size parameters. Do you do you use that, or you initialize yourself? What size parameters? Some of the yeah, the RX and TX yeah, sizes. Correct. Yeah, those those yeah. turn out to be really pretty small for yeah. for you know legitimate you know does all the input checks kind of. Processing. Um, we end up using a much bigger RX ring than the, the, the DPDK samples, for example. Yep. And and ditto for ditto yep. for TX, frankly. It's a 4K for. Uh, okay. So yeah. you're okay. 4K, and, 4K. Yep. Yeah. And what'll what'll end up happening is on TX, if the ring's full, it'll tail drop. The, you know, the, the typical case is you get you know you know two nearly line rate streams converging on a single output stream, and there you just you know you're not going to be able to transmit or see a tail drop. I have one. Yeah. Oh no, it's Magic. No, Magic, no. <laughs> magic, so, leave, the, leave the poor guy alone, will you? No, so, performance. <laughs> How do we scale performance? We scale it with uh, threads and cores. And maybe hyper threading if it works. Oh, threads work too. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I think the, uh, what, you, what you were saying about all these little hooks and tricks to make it multi thread safe and really performant. So, the question I have is very simple. Um, how does the how how do you expect the performance to scale with everything that you guys did with the number of threads, assuming that those threads each of them has a full core dedicated to it? Okay, so what we are seeing in the testing is that we are scaling almost linearly for the for the cases like IPv4 forwarding or IPv6. So it's really. A, I mean, it's not perfectly scaling. <coughs> it's not perfectly multiplication of the number of the, by number of the cores, but the numbers are very close. So, yeah. in the uh, performance uh, um, uh, tests or benchmarks for in computing, in high performance computing like SPEC and others uh, that Srikant, you and and others are using, uh, we call it a speed up, a linear speed up. Mm -hmm. So the expectation is that uh, unless somebody breaks the code, we're going to keep the linear speed up. Correct? Yeah. If somebody puts the counter like. Short counter, it will not be linear. Okay, thank you. <laughs>